the A10 Warthog. The opinions on these unique platforms are divided between the extremes. It's beloved and dismissed by those that see in the A10 a unique and essential capability and those that consider it outdated and with no benefit in a peer conflict. Seemingly there is no middle ground between both sides and now, even as the A10 is projected to be retired before 2030, the debate continues. In this video, sponsored by NordVPN, I will discuss the future of the A10 Thunderbolt 2 or Warthog. Sure enough, no aircraft can be kept in service indefinitely. But this bird has inched closer to that chopping block with every coming year. And taking that into account, let us try to sketch out what the near future might have in store for the mighty. Welcome back to Military Aviation History. My name is Chris and I explain all things air power. Who doesn't like air power, right? New episodes are coming out every Thursday on MAD, Military Aviation History Day. Yes, it's a thing. And if you enjoy my videos, past and present, support the channel via Patreon or channel memberships. It helps out immensely and you get yourself early access to videos, the community Discord server and more. So much cool stuff is coming up. Videos on the BF-109, the F-35, Soviet close air support, Chinese air power. The idea list is like, that long. It's awesome. I could talk about all of this every single day in my life and I do. So yeah, links are in the description. Alright, so specialized aircraft have the talent of dividing opinions, right? Specialization is both their best and their worst sales pitch. When we consider the future of the Warthog, we must, at this point now, leave emotion by the wayside. Especially with the A10, let's be honest, passions run very high. But I will do my very dramatic best to not get bogged down in the emotional arguments here. Instead, together we will look at the capabilities that the A10 offers and whether the operating force, well in this case it's of course the United States Air Force, as well as then the within that United States Armed Forces package and then even NATO needs this capability. And if they can substitute them with something else and what the overall cost benefit is on retaining the Warthog with their current or their future capabilities. All of this is important in this discussion. Let's now sum up the current capabilities of the A-10 without repeating the technical detail that, let's be honest, you know this anyway, right? If we sum it up to the essentials, the A-10 is a subsonic precision strike aircraft. Within this package, we find something unique. An aircraft that excels at close air support, has an effective 30mm gun for strafing, it can engage both armor and soft targets with general purpose and precision munitions, can operate low on the deck, has good loiter time, and is free to operate from more austere runways, and it has a marked psychological effect on friend or foe, as well as tying in directly with ground forces. They can't save the day again, baby. <laughs> Equally, it is a low-cost system compared to other mainstream multi-role jets. No other aircraft combines these capabilities into such an effective package as the A-10, and this specialization is a factor to consider. There is also no reason to question whether the A-10 is good at the mission it fulfills. For close air support, so CAS, it's a platform that does it really well and is operationally proven. However, this mission set is also highly dependent on the operational environment, which is where the criticism comes in. Looking at the prevailing criticism and support to the A-10, we do find a trend that describes the advantages and the disadvantages of this aircraft to lie within the margins rather than in the core of the plane's capabilities. And this directly ties into whether it is a platform that should be retained. The main argument is that the A-10 is a highly situational bird. It did really well in counterinsurgency operations, so COIN, yet there was very little anti-aircraft defense amongst the insurgents. In Desert Storm, the A-10 did well overall, but when it was on the receiving end of air defense fire, employment limitations became apparent, as a previous video has already shown. Though the A-10 is equipped with automatic missile warning systems, special armor for the pilot, and redundancy systems. These are designed to allow the pilot to survive and bail out safely. 
After all, the low altitudes at which the A-10 typically operates puts them at the receiving end of AAA and man pads, which are harder to identify, track and counter and potentially evade than long-range SAM fire. And if an A-10 takes a hit and keeps flying, that's great for the pilot, but it still needs extensive repairs and it might be out for weeks or even months. Comparing the A-10 then to multiple aircraft operating at high altitudes with precision guided munitions and in strike packages including uh, EW support, it often falls down to the following question. What do you want? A plane that doesn't get shot or a plane that can take a hit but then stands around the airfield? An aircraft that sits on the ramp waiting to be repaired is basically useless. However, in the A-10's defense, Though there are of course projected figures regarding attrition rates in a peer-to-peer -peer conflict coming from well, mainly the 1980s, it is likely that such high initial losses would result in the A-10 fleet being repostured and instead used more selectively than just in an all-out air assault. We already saw this during Desert Storm when a couple of A-10s were shot down by the Iraqi Republican Guard and as such the A-10s were pulled back from that area and the F-16s were sent in instead. This then calls into question whether the A-10 can be used as originally intended, as, although doing CAS really well, the plane does require circumstances to be just right to fly this mission. The A-10 received iterative improvements since the 1970s. It is now a very different machine, even to the one that existed in Desert Storm. One can really tell how this bird changed over the years. Much of this, of course, is centered around making it more effective in close air support. Early on with the A-10, there were quite a few problems. For example, the gases that were expelled by the gun stalled the engines. And then accuracy was always a problem. You were basically spraying a postcode because of the recoil. The aircraft's attitude couldn't be held. However, there were major improvements to the aircraft made. And in 1990, we have something called the Low Altitude Safety and Targeting Enhancement. And with that came EAC, which was the Enhanced Attitude Control, which later on then became PAC, which you may know if you, for example, are flying this aircraft in DCS. That is the Precision Attitude Control System. And what this does, it holds the aircraft's attitude while it's firing, it's trimming it out as well, and that maintains the accuracy of the gun without just spraying a whole area. You can really get a condensed cluster of rounds into a small area. In 1999, there were substantial navigational improvements with GPS and inertial navigation systems while the Hawk Up program was slotted to keep the Hawks flying until 2028. In 2005, the A-10C appeared and new defensive aids and, and precision guided munition carriages were added. Since then, targeting pods, multifunction displays and helmet mounted cues have ramped up the capabilities of this bird. Overall, the move away from head down controls and a centralization around the HOTAS for weapon employment also improved the pilot efficiency in using ammunitions. Another really cool change is on the vertical stabilizer. There used to be an X-band radar antenna there and there's photographic evidence of those antennas being in place. And that was dismounted on the A-10s eventually for a reason that will become very obvious in just a second. That antenna, what it was supposed to do is increase the radar signature of the aircraft in order to tell any friendly and well, friendly aircraft and also ground controllers where exactly it is to make well, cooperation and communication and also coordination a bit easier. However, at the same time as you're increasing your radar signature, you're also telling everybody who's out there where you are and where they can potentially shoot you. So it was done away with eventually. And if this is not proof that you really should not leave any traces of where you are, then I don't know what it is. And which brings us, of course, to today's sponsor, NordVPN. Let's be honest, would you fly around at 300 feet off the deck with every single gun shooting at you without armor and like triple redundancy on your hydraulics? No, you wouldn't. So why are you surfing on the internet without a VPN? That's right, I came at you with a hard hitting question, but now we're going to cheat because I already have the answer right here for you. It's NordVPN. With a simple click, actually, you don't even have to click anymore. You can just have auto connect turned on and that really helps. At least it was really helpful for me during my recent US inside the cockpit filming trip. I used NordVPN the whole time. With NordVPN, you can surf in foreign countries or in public Wi-Fi places and have that extra layer of security. It's like being wrapped comfortably in a titanium bathtub, just like piloting the A-10. 
And if you can't have enough of binge watching that latest show during your international travel times, well, NordVPN has you covered as well. Just change the location and you'll be streaming faster than a T-72 commander bails out when seeing a two ship of Hawks coming right their way. And unlike that tank commander, you do in fact get a 30 day money back guarantee. So sign up is risk free. Sign up to NordVPN below and get four months. Yes, that is four months for free. Fly covertly under that radar horizon of evil and miscreants of the internet and fulfill your mission. A10 style with some added security. The A10 has markedly improved in the close air support role over the years and in the past coin operations this has worked out really well. Now the Air Force finds itself in a different combat environment than a decade ago. We are once again talking about that, well, that peer adversary conflict, Russia and China are right there. The question then is, can the A-10 adapt to the modern iteration of this potential peer conflict? The requirement for CAS is not going away and the joint employment of air and ground is as important as ever. I'll spare you the time by not reading lengthy quotes from US doctrine. You can as always find all sources in the description. This is where the story gets interesting, because one on one, of course the A-10 can shoot missiles and drop bombs, just as well as the next aircraft, which works in its favor, but also to its detriment. But once you tie in the overall force, the specialized nature of the A-10 and its pilots gives you a platform that is optimized for ground support from the JTAC over to the pilot to the A-10 itself. This knowledge and training is perhaps one of the most interesting long-term aspects. The A-10 can't be kept indefinitely and is set to retire. Yet what happens with that extensive pilot knowledge and fixed wing cast currency within the Air Force and Army? Over the years, various options have been presented to expand the portfolio of the A-10 to retain its usefulness in the force. To put it frankly, the cast role is cool but this dedicated role is exactly the reason why the future of the A-10 is always being debated. If the A-10 is to be retained and stay effective, then we cannot base this on only sentiment and the coin operations of the past. Rather, we must make a case for which the A-10 really becomes an indispensable piece of kit in the US Armed Forces arsenal at least until, well, at least until the Hawks years truly are up and numbered and it must be retired. Nothing I will show you here means that the A-10 must switch from CAS, but rather that additional employment options will infer on the Warthog a rationale by which it becomes a force multiplier until the intended retirement at the end of the decade. This is a complex discussion about cost and benefits and we will likely never know the full answer for sure. I will go through some of the options here one by one, though as we do this, this is not a discussion about retaining the NA-10s by converting them to something completely new, but rather about shifting their main emphasis. The first option is a higher emphasis on bomb delivery as basically a bomb truck. With the improvements of the A-10, it is able to accurately drop general purpose or glide bombs from higher altitudes and its ordnance package of say plus minus 7,000 pounds provides options for hitting point targets, for example on interdiction missions. This would not be something new, but rather a renewed emphasis on a different capability that the A-10 has. Although it certainly isn't the major selling point. The A-10 would be far more vulnerable in deep penetrations due to its lack of speed and altitude compared to multi-role jets. The second option is a bit of a shift, and that is converting the A-10s into a long-range missile slugger. This can be done in two ways, either through the use of a smaller number of cruise missiles, or by loading up with long range but smaller and thus more missiles. Using both NLOS, no line of sight, and LOAL, so lock on after launch, an A-10 could sit outside short range air defenses and flexibly respond to pop-up targets and use its loiter time and carrying power to full advantage. Similar concepts are currently being tried by helicopter fleets in the US Army and elsewhere. The disadvantage is that such a profile is highly situational and will likely be covered by other platforms already. Given the A-10's characteristics as well as potential conflict zones in the future, a shift towards maritime patrol and defense may also provide some benefits. 
Its weaponry can be used effectively against smaller craft, from landing to patrol boats or generally adversary shipping, though an A-10 will need some sensor support from other platforms. Of course, it's not about sending a flight of warthogs against a whole enemy fleet, but in supporting or harassing actions, the same qualities that made the A-10 a good CAS aircraft may also lend itself to the maritime field. That being said, this is once again not a sailor in its own right, but rather a reposturing. In the past, we've also seen various aircraft that were kept in service by being converted into an aerial tanker. The intruder here springs to mind. A body tanker A-10 conversion is something that occasionally pops up every now and then. However, given that the plane itself has no refueling probe, but a receptacle, this currently makes at least A-10 to A-10 refueling unviable. There are also some doubts whether the A-10 design by itself, from the center of gravity problem, given the probable removal of a gun, to a performance perspective, would make it a good tanker in the first place. As the intruder has also taught us, a shift to air-to-air -to -air tanking is just a final step from being cut from the block. The most recent potential shift for the A-10 is one as a electronic warfare and air strike package support platform. It might sound strange, but the Air Force is testing so-called MALT, miniature air launch decoys, which duplicate the profile of other aircraft to confuse adversary air defenses. Unlike the old school use of chaff corridors laid by aircraft, this can provide standoff support for strike packages or can be used in diversionary actions. An A-10 can carry more miles than an F-16, for example, and the same number as a B-25, which means that it can operate in both a dedicated or in a swing role, pending operational requirements. Again, mild doesn't mean that the A-10 would lose its CAS pedigree, but rather it provides a useful force multiplier in situations where strong adversary air defenses can be expected, like in a pure conflict. And then the A-10s can be used in the, its traditional role when feasible also in such a conflict. Of course, there is a discussion to be had about the cost-benefit here, right? You won't be able to finance or sustain a near-constant A-10 foreship throwing out, like what, 60 plus miles every single time. But air power is always about investing resources to achieve strategic effect. And by equipping the A-10s in such a role, you confer on it new capabilities and you take off the load from other platforms as well that then can be used in their specialization and you support the Air Force mission organically as a whole. One of the reasons why the A-10 is often criticized is the abundance of short to long range air defense in peer conflicts. This threat picture is often used to argue that the A-10 will not be able to fulfill its role and is therefore a waste of money. Yet the opposite is also true. The A-10, as part of the threat package that the Air Force provides as a whole, and by extension that is conferred into the NATO force, also makes the A-10 a threat in being that infers operational costs on adversaries by having to account for the fact that an A-10 is in the theater. The easiest practical example of this is of course air defense. It is no wonder that during the Cold War the development of capable SHORATs, or short-range air defense, went hand in hand with the development of modern close air support and attack helicopters. We might as well bring up the fighting here in Ukraine. This currently shows how selective those cash missions are being fulfilled due to the existing air defenses in that conflict. Though I do hasten to add that the reason why the air war is so stagnant in the Russian-Ukrainian war is because neither side can or wants to force a complete offensive counter air and suppression of enemy air defenses campaign. NATO countries, at least in theory, would fight a very different air war. I too would have my doubts whether a formation of A-10s would be capable of fulfilling their role as they did in, say, the last decade in such a situation. However, the West has a completely different force package than Ukraine, meaning that it would fight a completely different air war with an emphasis on strong and flexible strike packages, extensive EW support, SEAT, so suppression of enemy air defenses, all within a force of state-of-the-art ISR, so intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, signal intelligence, electronic intelligence, and all the other buzzwords I can go through here. The A-10 represents one specific capability within this package, and the interaction between this capability and adversary capabilities is quite fascinating as a whole. Within this package, the A-10 is as much out of place as it could also be theoretically put to work, depending on how you argue your case. 
that with the Air Force posturing to the Indo-Pacific and considering the type of air war that the US and NATO allies would have to fight in Europe against Russia should Russia eventually decide to instigate a flashpoint, I find more often than not that the majority, not all, but that the majority of arguments for the A-10's retention are based more around sentiment, its coin legacy, or the marginal advantages that the platform offers, but that on the whole, I don't think that these justify an extended lifespan at the current deployment numbers. I really like this bird. It has aviation history written all over it and it has performed really well wherever it was deployed. However, I'm also conscious of the fact that it has to always present a cost benefit to the Air Force. And that means that in the future, as the combat environment is changing and as well, the Air Force has to pivot to new threats, the future of this bird is still unknown. So that means interesting times ahead. All right, Patreon and channel member questions are here. Big thank you for all your support and also big thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. First question, when choosing a museum for inside a cockpit, how does it work? Well, it basically starts off with, of course, all of you because inside the cockpit is 100% community funded. So what's the budget? Well, that's provided by you. And that gives us sort of a bandwidth of what we can operate in. Then we look at museums, you know, what sort of exhibits do they have? And then we enter sort of in discussions with them, which can happen between 12 to six months before we actually film there. And we talk about, you know, the level of access we get and so on and so forth and when filming can take place. And uh, it, it does take some time, but it's always a very fruitful discussion. And if you're actually working at a museum as a volunteer or full-time or part-time paid staff, and you think that this would be a cool little thing for your museum to have us over for inside the cockpit. You know, we are always have minimal impact on your daily proceedings. That's actually something we pride ourselves in. Unlike TV productions, we always hear from museums that our filming has zero impact on the daily proceedings. And, you know, TV always tries to shut down the whole museum for a day, which is completely unviable. Um, so yeah, we pride ourselves in the zero impact there. So if you work at a museum, let us know and uh, we can definitely make something work. Second question here about our next book. Well, so my next book is going to be in 2025. It's going to be about something with the Luftwaffe and uh, with the publishing house that I founded with uh, Bernhard from MHV. Our next book is actually coming out in April, not written by me or him, but a really, really cool book about a tank. And that should really, uh, you guys should have an eye on that because that is really, so, mm, uh, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. And then the last question here, comes from Joe and it's about aircraft designers. Cool idea, Joe. Um, it's, I'm just not a channel for it, I think. I'm not in, interested in individuals. I, I'm very honest about that. I'm interested in how does air power interact on sort of the tactical to strategic level. And what would interest me with designers is not how they create an aircraft, but sort of why and what sort of threat scenarios they design it for. So in that sense, yes, I am interested sort of in their perception of the future battle space, um, but I'm not interested in them or their lives themselves. So that's an idea maybe for another channel. Cool idea, just not, just not for me. All right, and thank you all of you Patreon channel supporters, and I wish all of you viewers also a great day and see you in the sky.